In this module, we're going to talk about small vessel and large vessel strokes. I think this is the best way to think about different stroke subtypes because the pathophysiology and mechanism of small vessel strokes is very different from large vessel strokes. Small vessel strokes occur when you have an infarct in the territory of one of the small arteriolar or small artery branches off of larger arteries in the brain, like branches off the MCA or branches off the PCA uh, or off the basilar. These are small arteries that usually branch off at 90 degree angles. The reason small, vo small vessel strokes occur is usually from years and years of hypertension or diabetes. Those are the two main risk factors. And over time, that causes this pathologic change in the blood vessels called lipohyalinosis. And at some point, um, we don't really know exactly what occurs when this happens, uh, the vessel just gets so damaged that it closes off and distal to that, you get a small infarct. These are also called lacunar strokes because they're very small, and on pathology, they look like little lakes inside the brain. This is opposed to large vessel strokes where the mechanism is very different. Um, these strokes are usually either thrombotic or embolic, um, and what that means is a uh, thrombotic large vessel stroke happens when there's an atherosclerotic plaque in a large vessel like the internal carotid or the middle cerebral artery. The plaque ruptures, thrombus forms on the surface of the plaque, and the vessel closes off right there. Large vessel strokes can also be embolic, where you have a blood clot that forms in the heart, um, travels north and lodges in a distal vessel in the brain, or if you have an atherosclerotic plaque rupture, for example, on the carotid artery, but the plaque doesn't close off the carotid itself, it breaks off and um, travels up and gets lodged in a distal vessel. The workup for small vessel versus large vessel strokes end up, ends up being a little bit different just because of these different mechanisms. So what are some ways that we, you might be able to differentiate between small vessel strokes or lacunar strokes and large vessel strokes? One way we clinically differentiate between small vessel and large vessel strokes is by the parts of the body that are involved. Remember that the ACA and the MCA each uh, cover a different part of the motor homunculus that's represented on the surface of the brain. So if you think about your homunculus, you have the legs that are dangling down in between the inner hemispheric fissure and then the arm and then the face, which is more lateral on the cortex. Face and arm is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and the leg is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. Now, in a small vessel stroke, you've got fibers that are going from the legs, the arms, and the face, and they all coalesce into the corticospinal tract, and that, of course, runs down through the posterior limb of the internal capsule and down through the brain stem. So there are a couple points where a very small stroke can cause weakness of the face, arm, and leg all together. Um, and that's why in a small vessel stroke, you wind up with face, arm, and leg weakness in proportion to one another. So just to recap, in a small vessel stroke, you generally get face equals arm equals leg weakness. And in a large vessel stroke, you get face arm weakness greater than leg weakness or leg greater than face arm. Another differentiating feature is in small vessel strokes, you typically get either motor or sensory symptoms, whereas in large vessel strokes, you get motor and sensory symptoms. So let's go over that in a picture. All right, so let's say this is your central sulcus, and then you've got your motor cortex right in front of the central sulcus and your sensory cortex right behind it. It's very hard for an ischemic stroke to hit, for example, just the motor cortex. Um, strokes are usually kind of wedge-shaped, and they're likely to hit motor and sensory cortex at the same time if they're large vessel. Now that's opposed to a small vessel stroke, which, since it's so much smaller, could potentially affect the posterior limb of the internal capsule in an isolated fashion and cause a pure motor symptoms. Or if it's in the thalamus, uh, which is a major sensory relay station, as you remember, you can have pure sensory symptoms on one side of the body. So with large vessel strokes, since they affect the cortex frequently, you often get what we call cortical signs with large vessel strokes. And the most important cortical signs are aphasia, field cut, hemineglect, and a gaze preference. 
In small vessel strokes, you typically don't get any cortical signs. What you often see are some distinct clinical syndromes that we call small vessel stroke syndromes. There are a huge number of these that neurologists know about, uh, but you should probably know about three important ones. And those are pure motor stroke, pure sensory stroke, and ataxia hemiparesis. Pure motor stroke is typically in the posterior limb of the internal capsule or in the base of the pons where the corticospinal tract is running down through the pons. Um, as we just talked about, pure sensory stroke is typically in the thalamus. And then the localization for ataxia hemiparesis is a little tricky, so I'm going to go over that in a little more detail. So this is a cross-section of the pons and the cerebellum. Um, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is right, and this is left. And here's your pons, here's your cerebellum. Okay, so remember, the right cerebellum controls the right side of the body, um, and the left brain controls the right side of the body. In ataxia hemiparesis, the ataxia is on the same side as the hemiparesis. So if you think about that for a second, a lesion in the right cerebellum would give you ataxia on this side, but then if the lesion involves any motor fibers, then the weakness should be on the opposite side. So why are the weakness and the ataxia on the same side of the body? So cutting back to our cross-section, um, remember that if the right cerebellum controls the right side of the body, it actually gets input from the entire left hemisphere, because the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. So you have descending fibers um, from all over the brain, from the left side, that synapse in the base of the pons and then cross over to the cerebellum. And that's how they modulate right-sided coordination. You also have the corticospinal tract running down in the front of the pons. So if you have a stroke on this side, um, you're going to hit the corticospinal tract on the left, and that will cause weakness on the right side of the body. You're also going to hit these crossing cerebellar fibers that are heading toward the right cerebellum, so that'll cause ataxia also on the right side. So one of the major localizations for ataxia hemiparesis is the base of the pons. Now you might be wondering, well, I thought he just said that uh, the base of the pons is where you get a pure motor stroke. The way that happens is that if you have a small stroke that's just a little more anterior, then you'll have pure motor symptoms, pure hemiparesis. Um, and if the stroke extends a little bit like this, which is often what you get with a perforator into the pons, you hit both the motor tracts and the cerebellar fibers and you get ataxia hemiparesis. There's a second localization for ataxia hemiparesis, and it has to do with the cerebellar output fibers. So if this is our right and this is our left, and here's our cerebellum down here, corticospinal tract is going to run down through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, through the brain stem. It'll cross in the medulla and then head out to control the right side of the body. Cerebellar outputs will head from the right cerebellum, if we're talking about controlling the right side of the body, they're going to need to get over to the left hemisphere. So they actually head up this way, actually synapse in the thalamus, which is right around here, and then head up to control our motor function in both the primary and the supplementary motor cortex. If you have a stroke that affects both those ascending cerebellar fibers and the descending corticospinal tract, um, you can wind up again with ataxia and hemiparesis on the same side of the body. These strokes are usually a little above the posterior limb of the internal capsule, which is about right here, or if they hit the posterior limb and a little bit of the thalamus, that's how you wind up with ataxia hemiparesis. Okay, so that covers the way to differentiate clinically between small vessel and large vessel strokes. And it matters a little bit in clinical practice because of the different pathophysiology of small versus large vessel strokes. Our approach to workup and treatment differs a little for these two different stroke subtypes.